Hey there, creatives. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Creative Psychotherapist podcast. Today, you're going to be listening to episode two of 2023's Voices from the Expressive Therapy Summit special series with special guest Lori Rappaport. And today, uh, she is sharing a lot about focusing oriented therapy and also focusing oriented expressive arts therapy. And I think that you're going to really enjoy the conversation that we had. Lori shares some really cool stories and um, gives a little uh, bird's eye view about just some really magical um, experiences that have occurred in her life as an expressive arts therapist and um, and doing this work. And I just found the conversation to be really inspired. And, um, and of course, I learned a lot too, and I think you will as well. She's going to be teaching at the upcoming Expressive Therapy Summit on March 23rd uh, via Zoom. It's virtual. So if you are interested and wanted to attend, uh, you could without leaving your home, which is really exciting. And uh, she's going to be teaching more um, focusing expressive art uh, therapy as a trauma-informed approach. And you can find more about that by heading over to the Expressive Therapy Summit website, simply expressivetherapysummit.com, and click on the virtual event tab. And then once you're there, you can click on the sessions menu, and then you can put in there focusing, and her session will pop up. It'll um, it'll the, in the search feature, uh, or you could look by date, which is March twenty third, and it'll be there. All right. Without further ado, I will allow you to listen to our conversation. The Creative Psychotherapist is the official podcast of the Creative Clinician's Corner, a practice building resource for creative psychotherapists. TCP Podcast is the cast for creative, expressive, and experiential focused psychotherapists curious to learn how to design, build, and scale a thriving private practice. Your host, Raina Lombardi, interviews successful therapists about the tools and strategies they have used to develop creative focused practices. They also talk about the products, services, and side hustles they have developed using their knowledge and creativity to enhance their therapy practices, make a greater impact in their communities, and diversify their income streams. Welcome. Now here's your host, Raina Lombardi. Thanks so much for listening to the Creative Psychotherapist podcast. I'm really excited for this next episode. It is a Voices from the Expressive Therapy Summit special series in 2023, episode two, with guest Lori Rapaport. And Lori teaches expressive arts therapies and art therapy and has served on the faculties at Lesley University, Notre Dame de de Namur University in California, Sonoma State University, the California Institute of Integral Studies, and Meridian University. She's the author of Focusing Oriented Art Therapy, Accessing the Body's Wisdom and Creative Intelligence, and the editor slash author of Mindfulness and the Arts Therapies. Lori is a focusing coordinator with the International Focusing Institute and the founder director of the Focusing and Expressive Arts Institute. Welcome, Lori. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here with you and everybody else. Yeah, I'm happy to, to I'm excited to talk about um, this topic with you. And I'm wondering if we could just start by introducing listeners who may not be familiar with focusing oriented therapy or focusing oriented psychotherapy, what that is. Okay, so you want me to speak about 
not related to the arts, just the purity of focusing and focusing oriented therapy first? Yeah, we'll start there and then we'll kind of pull sure. in like how you've integrated the arts into your specific approach. Um, I think that would be helpful. Sure. Well, focusing is a an approach that was developed by a psychologist and philosopher, Eugene Genlin. And Eugene Genlin was, it, you have to go back to the 1960s. He was, yeah, that's how far back. He was actually at the University of Chicago and was there at the same time that Carl Rogers, who's known for client-centered psychotherapy. And so I'll tell the little story because it's hard to describe focusing without talking about their meeting. Okay. So, so focusing... Well, well, I'll just say that Jen Lin met Carl Rogers and they did a research project on what made psychotherapy effective. Mm -hmm. And they, they asked several questions about, you know, what is it that happens in psychotherapy when it is effective? And what makes it not so effective? And and I think it's important to go back to this the that time period, because there weren't even that many different kinds of therapies like we have today. Yeah, and there really wasn't that much. There wasn't even the phrase evidence based. Like, how do we know it works, right? And so they actually conducted a huge research project, and they explored those questions, and they. They anyway, they were the first psychologists to um, to make audio tapes of therapy sessions and then transcribe them. And in the transcription, they were doing the research and they were looking for change, like how clients change. And it was based on what the client said about themselves and what the therapist observed and also what a significant other said. And they went through these transcripts and they they looked for people who talked about their early childhood experience, because that'd be more psychoanalytic. And people who spoke about the client-centered, the client-therapist relationship would be client-centered. And then there was another category. And they, they found that it made absolutely no difference what the theoretical approach was. What made the difference was how the client was talking and so it wasn't even what the therapist was doing and they so they could hear that those clients it correlated with change that those clients who you know how like when you're talking so a lot like sort of right now like oh um you know maybe maybe i'm talking about something and i i'm like oh you know Actually, this thing happened and I felt anxious. Oh, you know, wait a minute. No, you know, it's not anxious is not it. It was excited. That's it. I feel excited, right? Mm -hmm. So those clients, they could hear that there were certain people that spoke that way. So what were those clients doing? They were able to sort of hear something inside mm -hmm. and check it. And no one's when a word or f to describe it felt right or not, right? And so they could predict by the second therapy session which clients would improve and which one, ones wouldn't based on how this way of talking. And wow. this was the brilliant Eugene. I know it's amazing. Eugene Jenlin said, well, if some clients naturally talk this uh, are able to do this let's teach people how to do this this way of listening inside and so that's what he developed this process that he named focusing and focusing is essentially this way of bringing mindful awareness into the body in the present moment and it's there's a pause right so there's a slowing down there's a pause and there's a, a turning inside to just notice how is it on the inside right now? And that's how he developed focusing. And then there's, 
he has this way of like in helping people notice like is it jumpy is it warm is it you know what's going on because most of the time we like are living in our heads in our brains yeah he really directed people to our body and and the knowing and the wisdom that's in there and so that's essentially what focusing is it's a turning the attention inside with what he called a friendly attitude friendly curiosity and just noticing what's there and that's really it and then he said i'll, I'll tell this part because it links to how my thing he'd say is there a word or a phrase an image a gesture or a sound that matches that inner felt sense right so he called that inner place like that listening to the body sense mm -hmm. the felt so he termed felt sense because now today it's used in a lot of somatic therapies. People right. like use felt sense, felt sense. But actually that was Jenlin's term that he, he made up. And he was very good at making up words that that matched that inner experience. And you, when you get it, right, it's a felt sense. And so he'd say, is there a word, a phrase, an image, a gesture, a sound? And then in the focusing process, we check inside to see what just like those clients did you is that right no and you wait till there's a match and that that's essentially it and so focusing that he developed he also developed that could be applied in psychotherapy which is called focusing oriented therapy or focusing oriented psychotherapy or it could be used you know in education in coaching in wellness in self-care in human relationships so he felt like this process which is true that some clients did it naturally right mm -hmm. this process he said is a human process mm. right and so he said and so it's for everyone it doesn't belong to anybody and it's oh, one of the things that i love yeah. about focusing yeah because it is for therapy and so therapists can learn it and integrate it into therapy but it, he developed something called changes which were groups where anybody any 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 human could come and people would learn focusing and it also integrates listening kind of kind of like the rogers listening but a little bit different and and, and th those still go on today like all over the world wow Thank you so much for kind yeah. of providing that foundation. Um, and it sounds like in the way you were describing the way he would question or help people to tune in to what was going on inside, the words that he used were so naturally connected to creative expression. I'm wondering if that was kind of what what drew you into um, how you work with focusing and the focusing oriented art therapy? Yes, to totally. I mean, it's a total direct connection. Um, so I was a graduate student at, at Leslie. It was called Leslie College then. In the, I was a student in 1977, so it was a very long time ago. Yeah, wow. I, know. I know. <laughs> And while I was a student, I learned focusing, um, not as part of the program. But anyway, that's a whole different story. But when I learned focusing, I, I was struck by this, is there a word, phrase, image, gesture, or sound that matched that inner felt sense? And well i i think i will add this little story to it the way i learned focusing what was i i you know when you're in graduates when you're studying or training to be a therapist of any kind they always say you know it's very useful to go into your own therapy and okay. and i i believe that i think we can only know how to help someone else if we know how all these workings and how hard it is really too you know mm -hmm. so i was i was seeing this therapist and you know at that time it was the very beginning of expressive arts therapies um and art therapy too early days expressive arts came later 
and I saw this therapist. And so there were there were really were, there were no art therapists or expressive therapists for me to go to. And I went to somebody who was highly recommended. And then I would be talking to her, you know, you know, it was talk therapy. And then every so often, you know, something I'd be talking and then, you know, there's that moment when something starts to come up, but you kind of don't yet know what it is, but you kind of also want to push it down and you don't really want to be too vulnerable. And yes. that she would sense my little struggling in there. And she would just, she would just say this. She would just slow down and she would gesture to like, she'd kind of have her, her hand come. She'd, she'd just say, and can you sense how that feels inside? And when she invited me to sense, it got quiet and there was a pause. And it, it was, a, there was a silence there, but it, you know, it wasn't an uncomfortable silence. It was a supportive silence. It's like, you have a gift right now to go take the time to listen inside, to, to see how it is, right? And then she did that thing, I think, is there a word, phrase, image, gesture, sound? And so often I got an image, right? Or sometimes I got a word or phrase, but often I got an image. And so because I would then leave the therapy. I had a good session. I'd leave the therapy. I go back to my apartment and I would draw or create whatever that was that came up in the therapy. And it was always amazing. And so then I learned, you know, then I started to train in focusing and I was like, oh, I think I'll try it. I you know I was in my practicum and my practicum was in psychiatric day treatment. It was the beginning of deinstitutionalization when they because there were when I was there as a student, I worked also in the state hospital where people had some people had been there for like 25 or 50 years in the back wards. Wow. And they were just starting to empty them, you know, and move people into these into the community, into day treatment. And so that was that was the first place I tried it out. I was like, okay, I'm a student and I think these can go. So, you know, I, I did it. Um, I, I, the first group I had was on uh, stress reduction, which even back then, the 70s, people didn't even call anything stress reduction. But somehow I had read one book that had this guided relaxation. It was I Samuels and Samuels, like visualization and imagery or something that's not the name of it but it, it was Samuels and Samuels and there were all these guided imagery things and relaxation and I was like I think that's good to do with the population so I I just made it up you know I I guided them and and people said to me you can't have people you know with severe mental illness like that close their eyes or go inside and um, well, there's two things. One is with focusing, you don't have to, you, some people like to close their eyes because they're listening into the body, yeah. but it's yeah. true that it's not safe for everyone to listen into the body. So, and that's, that's where the arts are so great because you can start with art or whatever. But I had worked with this pop, you know, the, it was, it was a pretty consistent group and I knew them and I had a good connection with them. So I did guide them into taking a moment to check inside, to breathe and notice any places of tension and get the felt sense and then to draw what, what how it felt inside. And so mm -hmm. like, I just showed this last night, actually. One one person got this image of, um, there was a, like a person and there were like these hammers coming towards his, his uh, head, you know, oh, like wow. all the stress, yeah, and on the feet. And then we would do some kind of expressive arts like dance movement therapy or often dance movement or, but it could be breathing. We did some breathing or, or some playing musical instruments stuff. And then, so we would do that for like 10, 15 minutes. And then after I would have them go back inside and focus again and then see, is it the same as before? Or is it different? And it was, oh, and then to get a felt sense and and you know to get an image and and draw it and so that like that person who i just described when he drew it i have the drawing it's in my book actually suddenly like the head the head is bigger and the arrows are going away instead of the hammers coming in now it's all going away and the person looks happy you know 
Wow. And somebody else's, I show this other drawing, it's like all this tension, like this red knot. You know, we know you get a knot in the stomach. It was kind of <laughs> like that, a knot in the stomach. It was red. And then we did the art stuff. And then the next drawing, you see the next one was, a, it was just like a yellow flower, just like a beautiful, beautiful, happy flower, you know, just so released. And so, you know, then it was kind of like, wow, you know, you, you, you know, you could see the change, right? Mm -hmm. Eugene Jenlin in focusing has a phrase, he made this one up too, called felt shift. Ooh. And the felt shift, yeah, it's a great phrase. Felt shift is yes. like the way you feel the change in your body, right? So you like, you know, when something, it, fe it feels different. And so I say like in, you know, so I combined Eugene Genlin's focusing with art therapy and expressive arts therapy. And I say, and you can see the felt shift in the art, in the arts. Mm -hmm. And that's what you could see. He used. So that's, I always loved it. I thought that, that is so awesome. <laughs> no, that is really, really cool. And I, it makes total sense. The felt shift. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can, I can even... see it resonated. It, I can see it resonated with you. <laughs> yeah, I I feel like I've had those moments in my own therapy where you know mm -hmm. you it's just like oh I felt that transition now it's yeah. in a different place. Um, but also, and it's like the whole thing. It's a whole change in the body and the mind. Mm -hmm. You know the heart and the spirit it's it's like a whole body shift change definitely and yeah. seeing that happen with clients too um is a really cool process and for them yeah. to recognize it in the artwork and see it in the well, artwork you know no, that's that I think was what was really exciting for me is to see like for me to see it, but they then could see it, they could feel it, and then they could see it. And that's the, you know, I thought of it like biofeedback, you know, because biofeedback, you have those monitors yes. that like, helps you to see, to learn the change. And I thought, oh, this is like biofeedback, you know, through the arts. De definitely there's yeah. something about that we even have that saying in our culture well you have to see it to believe it right right right, <laughs> right. that's right and, and so there is something that happens when something that was intangible now has some tangibility in our ability to kind of integrate that information in a different way than mm -hmm. without yeah yeah so then you know then I just tried it out I mean that was like 1978 I think and then after that I just kept trying with every population I ever worked with so I did it with you know people with trauma and people with uh anxiety depression people with medical issues you know in with cancer and pain and I worked with children and adolescents, adults and families. And also, you know, you know, I did it with organizations because you like I said, you can there's a therapy application, but you can apply it anywhere, really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it definitely seems um, very flexible and because mm -hmm. of how you described it, that this is a human process that all human beings can um, experience and understand that mm -hmm. it makes sense that no matter what population that you're working with, that it would be accessible. Right. And it's like, because Jenlin said, you know, that focusing is a human process and then it's also the arts are a human process, right? Yes. Yes. You just go think of any child and they did all the arts before talking, right? Mm -hmm. Drawing, you know, drawing, painting, playing, singing, dancing, everything, imaginative play, all of that. So it's it's in it's they're both in in all of us. And and so 
in my teaching, you know, I, I have what I call quote foundational principles. And one of them is what I, I do call it clinical sensitivity. But I realize, you know, when it's applied, maybe outside of a clinical thing, maybe it's sense of sensitivity, but the clinical sensitivity is, is like what you're saying. It can, I really believe focusing oriented art therapy, or I call it focusing oriented expressive arts for people so that it it's not therapy, right? And you can mm -hmm. apply it in different settings and stuff. And, um, but what I say is it, we have to adapt it to the person or to the group or to the organization. And so that that is the key thing. And the other foundational principle, which is actually the first foundational principle, is that safety comes first. And Gene Genlin said that in Focusing. And I, I always loved that he said that. He said, safety comes first. He said, focusing doesn't come first. Safety comes first. I was like, oh, God, that's so great. Because, you know, he wasn't just trying to sell his thing because he never looked at it that way. Mm -hmm. And actually, he, you know, and so I say that in the folk foundational principles that, so if you're always paying attention to safety, then then you're also with the, the, the clinical sensitivity. Like, is this something that should somebody go inside and listen to their body in that way? Right. And if it's not safe, you know, then, then no, you, you can still do it without, and it, it has to do with how you introduce things. Because the important thing is speaking in a way that helps people to slow down and to take the time to sense inside, like what I was describing with how I felt in that therapy. The therapist didn't tell me she was doing focusing or doing anything, but she spoke in a way that helped me to go there. And so mm -hmm. even with art making, right, you know, if you do, you know, if you wanted people to like, um, you know, take, you could just say, like, if you were going to work on resources, right, just take a moment to become aware of the resources in your life, mm -hmm. right, or take a moment to become aware of a place that's peaceful for you, where you've experienced some calmness or peacefulness, you know, it might be a place that you know, or maybe a place you make up in your imagination. So, so you give someone time to sense it. And then you could say, and notice how it feels when you imagine that place, mm -hmm. right? When you bring that into your awareness. Now, are there any colors or shapes or create something to express how it feels inside when you imagine that peaceful place or when you have that resource? So that, so I teach people that, that yes, you don't have to go like, okay, close your eyes. You know, I never say, I never tell anybody to close their eyes. But that's where, like, I, I now have a terms for it where in um, with focusing oriented art therapy or focusing oriented expressive arts, you could either start with a focusing process, mm -hmm. which is that way of slowing down and listening inside to the body for people who can do that. And then from that, getting the arts expression, or you just start with the arts expression. Yeah. Right. But then you can integrate like, oh, so notice how that feels inside or is there any, you know, when you listen inside, is there anything it wants to say or you you you, you integrate focusing in, in that way or, or like I just described, I always say like the felt sense is in the art making, mm -hmm. right? Because in the art making, the body is engaged. Whether you're doing visual art or music or dance or drama, and I think that's why it, for me it connected so well because focusing teaches about the the body sense, but the when you're doing the arts, it's just in there. Yeah, it is a very embodied experience. It's difficult to take that out, right? Even in understanding media, media principles and how we manipulate a material is very much connected to that sensitivity of pressure of of um you know all different kinds of things but uh, there is a a connectedness when you're creating in order to get the material to do what you want it to do 
right? You can see sometimes when people don't have that, there's a disconnect there, right? If somebody is not understanding why their material keeps crumbling or the pencil lead keeps uh, smushing and they have to keep sharpening it because they're um, not able to just gently make those motions on the paper lightly uh, that they're putting so much pressure on there. They're not connecting, um, not really feeling into that connection. Right. That's right. Right. And, and it is true, like what you're saying, that, that that's why the just the choice of materials, the color or the pressure is connected to that inner felt sense. Mm -hmm. All the choices about even which material to use, like do I, does paint feel like the right thing or does clay feel like the right thing or does the sound of the drum feel like the right mm -hmm. thing? And, and, it, and you know it's right, but you, like there's that connection and you know when it's right and you know and, you know, and then it, it continues to unfold until you feel like it's, it's done. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah it's great that you really you know you 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 get it so so deeply too I yeah I feel it, it very resonant um with the approach and I haven't read your book fo on focusing but I have read the chapter I have your book uh the mindfulness um approaches and I have read that chapter a couple of times in there on uh on focusing mm -hmm. and um have tried some of the experientials on my own um so That's I definitely yeah yeah I definitely have an appreciation for uh the approach I also mm -hmm. feel like it is very resonant with other approaches too that we use or um, maybe have kind of grown out of that, even in hearing you talk about like the safety comes first and really thinking about, you know, what does a safe place look like? How very connected to um, EMDR, right? That, that's, yeah. mm -hmm. and even the feeling in and what's the image that you're seeing like, within. Like, mm -hmm. um, but so many of the principles um, are the same. We don't want to take somebody there who's not ready to go in. Um, right. 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 Mm -hmm. Closing your eyes. Um, I know for yeah. me, it's hard. It's hard for me to feel in without closing my eyes, even like yeah, thinking and yeah. talking with you. I, my yeah. eyes are naturally closing when I'm thinking <laughs> about feeling inward. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that because that feels that's how you connect and you feel safe to do that. And so then in working with others, it is just holding that sensitivity. And, you know, when you're guided by that, then then I think for like all of us as therapists, it's it's kind of to let go of our agenda. Right. Is to really help, you know, yeah. the person feel that sense of safety so that they can be who they authentic, who they authentically are. So I don't have a judgment that even they have to eventually get to that place. Like, no. See what happens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody's and, on and their honor, own path. And honor them. Honor them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at what point did, after you've been uh, developing and and really um, kind of honing in onto your principles and developing this method. Did you branch out and create the the training institute, the focusing um, oriented expressive arts institute? Well, it's sort of an interesting question that I I don't think I, I don't think anybody's ever asked before, like so specifically. So I'll tell you that, you know, I had been combining focusing with art therapy and focusing with expressive arts for probably 30 years. And I had been presenting the work at conferences and I was teaching it, you know, at, at Leslie. 
And that's why I first made it up, focusing in expressive arts, expressive therapies, and taught it at CIA at California Institute of Integral Studies one summer. And um, anyway, it was when I was turning 50. <laughs> I thought, what, what haven't I done that I want to do? And actually, it was like the book. That's what came. Like, I was actually felt like... I never thought of myself as a writer. I mean, I, ha I had been trying to, I had been writing some articles, but I, you know, some people know, like, I want to write a book. I didn't know I wanted to write a book, but turning 50 kind of woke <laughs> me up. To, like, I thought if I don't write, you know, I made all this stuff up. I was teaching it and I thought, I might, I, might, I don't know if I want this edited or not. I may or may not. But, you know, I did think, I, I think I'll be pissed off if somebody else writes the book and I don't write the book. So it motivated me. Sure. Yeah, no, I don't know how I feel about it, but I think it's fine. But it did motivate me to write a book, that book of the first book being Focusing Oriented Art Therapy. And it was, I loved the process of writing because in, you know, I had a body of work really for 30 years with different clients and all kinds of populations. And I had also, you know, a lot of, a lot of, you know, Jenlin's writings and stuff like that. I, but I went through all of the client, all the work, all the examples. And, and I, I, it was really a recent, you know, it really is grounded research. That's really what it is. I didn't know that's what it was, <laughs> what it was really a grounded research project. And then I started to you know, put things into categories and make like meaning out of it. Like I constructed the theory. Mm -hmm. So, so now, so now, so that book then became like, I got to like figure out what, what am I doing? So, you know, the first three chapters in that book are, are, are about like focusing and describing that because in art therapy, no, hardly, nobody, hardly anybody knew of it. But then, you know, I, I created what I call theme directed approach, which has to do like with the peaceful place or source of strength or resources, which are tool, like themes for resilience enhancement, because I had I needed to work with people in a safe way. And so mm -hmm. just doing like, how are you and all, all this stuff on the inside, it wasn't safe to. Sure. So I, I, I did that uh, theme directed. And then, you know, I just was able to name things like Jenlin has in his, he, he, when he first developed focusing, he created six steps. And the first step was called clearing a space, which you don't need to do step one in order to do focusing. But when he was developing it in the sixties, that's what he came up with. And then things evolved, but clearing a space was a way to take inventory of like what's going on inside of me that's in the way of feeling really here right now or feeling okay or feeling I call it all fine and what he would do is have you imagine placing each of those things at a distance between you and it each stressor so you know okay I'm a bit mm, uh you know, stressed out about this work that I have to do, right? So I imagine placing it at a distance or, oh, I have this pain in my you know, side here. So I can imagine placing that at a distance. He said, it was, it's kind of like when you clear your space, clear your desk to get some work done. That was the first thing, clear it. And then he had people leave it there and sense the place that is separate from all of that. Mm -hmm. And really, it ha when I first did that as as in the ex learning focusing, I couldn't believe what I found inside. Seriously, wow! Because when I left all that, what was left was just this sense of well well being, right? Mm -hmm. A sense of there was a vitality there that was you know, it, ha it was like a quiet, vital energy, you know, it was a sense of well-being. It was free of stress and free of it, all the stress and worries were out outside. And, and he said, you know, what, oh, he developed it, he found this process that then, you know, in, in the focusing method, like, then you have this better sense to then go pick 
one thing up and work on it. And, and that's what his original focusing method was. Since all of that, and that's why it's developed, that it was found like people would do clearing a space with people with cancer or people with pain. And wow. yeah, I can and see how it, profound that would be. Yeah. And the research shows, you know, that it, it like it just helped people's pain levels go down. People felt better sense of their bodies. Um, yeah, there's a, a a research project I did with a group of Leslie faculty, actually, and it is on focusing in expressive arts with people with cancer. And and um, those results were were really interesting. But yeah, so so they found that this process clearing a space could be a standalone thing. It didn't have to be a step of focusing. You can just do that for stress reduction, right? So it's fantastic. So I then developed it to be not just imagining it, because this was all regular focusing all like imagining it. I had people create things like the things in the way and you could put them aside and, you know, you can move them around the room. You could put them in boxes, all kinds of ways of, you know, you, with expressive arts, you could take scarves and throw them places or whatever. You know, you could do a lot of things. But I think the key thing then is taking time to sense the place when you get rid of all that, this sense of well-being. You don't call it well-being. You just call it like the place that's okay or the place that's all fine. And then people get a a felt sense. And Jenlin called that word, phrase, image, gesture, or sound a symbol or a handle. And then, you know, that's what gets expressed. And I can tell you, I've done it with hundreds of people, this exercise. And it is amazing. Like I, I, I haven't done the actual, you know, written research or, you know, followed it, but observationally what people express this all fine place or this sense of well-being is, is just everybody finds it mm -hmm. <laughs> and it affirms you know with which all the all the great spiritual teachers that you know there is an inherent place of well-being and wellness in us mm -hmm. and it's it's like the clouds you know when you clear them you can find that that radiant light yeah Right. So anyway, to, you know, just to follow. So, you know, the book then became finding, okay, there's theme directed. Okay, there's approach, clearing a space with arts. And then there's things like what I call a folk check-in, which is then it's for people who can check in. And then mm. there's working on an issue where you work more, you know, more in depth from the folk check-in. And, and so the book came and then, I finished it in 2009, it got published. And then, you know, you know, it's like you, you all these things just kind of, I just had a, a call, you know, it's just was born in me, you know, to unfold. And that's what focusing and creativity is about, it unfolds. Right. Don't know where it's going. I had no idea. I had no idea from, you know, 1977 where I was going. But the book, that then puts, it out in the world in a way that yeah, I had no idea that so many people would learn about it. And right. so that's what started to happen is not only was I teaching it in conferences or this, but the book went out and then, and then people were wanting to learn it. And um, so then it was in 2010, because I left Boston, like Cambridge, and moved to California. Wow. So yeah. And that was like, I guess this is a little storytelling, right? So that's okay. Yeah. yeah Cause it's, a, it was such a synchronistic thing. It's, it's like that, that thing that you never know why something happens in your life. Mm -hmm. Like it happens years before and you don't know how it's going to influence your life, but then it could be 10 years later or 20 years later that, that, that thing. So what happened was when I was going, I'm going backwards to Leslie, I was there teaching on faculty in, in the 1990s. And um, when I was, I was, I was the academic coordinator of international expressive arts. And there we had Natalie Rogers, who is the founder of person-centered expressive arts come as a guest lecturer. And then I was the faculty liaison and 
you know, this was pre very early days of internet. So it's not like, so we met and, but we had a very strong connection and that was 1996. It took seriously 20 years because it was in, we, we kept in touch sometimes, but not that much because really the internet wasn't really active till a lot later, but I did visit her once in like, I don't know, 2001 maybe, but then 2006, she, she, she lived, so she lived in Santa Rosa, California, and she had a house on a beautiful piece of land. And she had her institute there, the Person-Centered Expressive Therapies Institute, Expressive Arts Therapies Institute. They call it Pacetti. And so it turned out she was going to move and she was selling her house. And she sent this email to like 100 people. And it turns out, here we were on the East Coast, me and my husband, we had no plan to move to California. But she sent this email and then it just opened the door of like, my husband's like, well, we can move there. I was like, what? Like, it's not like we had, could have two homes <laughs> or live in two places and our daughter was going to college, but he's very jokey and funny. And he, anyway, long story short, that's what happened. We bought Natalie Rogers house. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So, and wow. so it, yeah, I know. I know. And actually telling you the story from where I started, it was like, you know, Eugene Jenlin was with Carl Rogers, Natalie Rogers yes. was Carl Rogers' daughter. I, and now he's, crazy. I know, I know, I know, it's crazy. And uh, then I lived in her house, you know, she moved out, but she lived in the next town. So we had a connection and she would still come over, but she had a 900 square foot studio, which is also where she did her institute work and in expressive arts. And and so it, it was just there for me, really. Like the birth, beautiful. the birth of the Focusing in Expressive Arts Institute was just, well, it should be here. Like, <laughs> and, you know, I'm so grateful, like for the magic, really. It just, mm -hmm. it was magical to, I don't know how it happened, you know, like, you know, it, it was magical to have those be in a, you know, it is about a higher purpose or something, or mm -hmm. I don't know what you want to call it, but, you know, for the fact that I was in that job at that time, the fact that I connected with Natalie, the, the fact that it was like my daughter was going to camp was the reason out here, which was the reason we came to visit Natalie, like five or six, six or seven or eight years before we actually heard about her selling or how I don't know it was all yeah beautiful thing so I think that's that's thank you so much for sharing that story I find it so inspiring and I think that for folks that are you know new in the field and feel a sense of like why well, I don't know what I'm doing yet and I don't know how it's all going to come into play to hear you talk about you know it's okay not to know that like yeah. you just keep you know following what you're connected to in the work and that has a way of leading in this really beautiful unfolding um over the course of of your career is really beautiful oh yeah thank you frank thank you for that reflect no i could feel how like moving it was for you to like receive yes. the story yeah. yeah so cool and those that connection between um the rogers and the focusing i really no, I, I know I know it, it's unbelievable like you couldn't really write that ahead of time mm -hmm. but I love what you just said about for others who maybe are newer in the field or or even if you're not newer you know at any point but it is about if you really feel something is important you know if your heart, heart and soul resonates with it it is to just follow just 
trust it. Like, you know, some, it's not, it's not always easy and it's not always clear, but that's what I mean. There, there's that, that the mystery and the magicalness of somehow it will connect maybe later, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's, it is, it is, it is fun to kind of be able to, you know, in a certain sense, you know, being older, having all this life experience, I, you know, to look back and see those threads of connection and how they kind of happened and the influences and, and how Absolutely. It, it is all like tied together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. Mm -hmm. So I want to be respectful, respectful of your time. And I know that you're going to be uh, teaching at the upcoming Expressive Therapy Summit. What is your session going to be about and what would participants um, expect to learn in that session working with you? Okay, great. Well, the session is called Focusing Oriented Expressive Arts as a Trauma-Informed Approach. So that's a lot in three hours, but it's doable. I've done it before. And um, so essentially people will learn the basics of focusing really a little to get more clarity about that. Um, and then the integration with expressive arts. So focusing oriented expressive arts and then the how it's a trauma informed approach. So I'll, I'll say a little bit more, which is you know, I, I give the, I say this metaphor that if I were to serve you a pureed soup, vegetable soup, mm -hmm. you would know there are vegetables in there, but it might be hard to identify which which ones, right? Maybe mm -hmm. some. And it's the same challenge in teaching focusing oriented expressive arts because there's a way I could just leave people in an integrated focusing oriented focusing expressive arts experience, but people won't really understand what the focusing part is. So I do like to teach people what the focusing part is. Mm -hmm. So there's that, and there are experiential exercises. So I, I'm very good at a bit of didactic overview of things along with experiential exercises to teach that. So there's an embodied knowing. So that on focusing, um, then yeah, the background of focusing oriented expressive arts and people heard a lot through this, but you, you see more visual things because I use PowerPoint and have examples and stuff. It just and then we beautiful do... pictures. Yes, right. That's true. And then uh, we do an experiential on, um, you know, to teach a theme directed approach to focusing oriented expressive arts. So that's kind of like the first part or half or two thirds, but then I, 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 I developed, um, I was working a lot with trauma and I, I always had Judith Herman's model in my mind, my, my awareness, Judith Herman wrote, you know, early book on about trauma and recovery. She was one of the first really early authors on trauma. And I love, I loved her model, which has to do with establishing safety, um, working through the trauma and reconnection with ordinary life. And I actually wrote an article in a, in a journal about focusing oriented art therapy and used Judith Herman's model as a reference. And, and I, that was in 2010. And I, I did love it's, you know, focusing oriented art therapy and trauma. It's in the journal of person centered and experiential therapies but over the years since 2010 actually I was writing a chapter for, in a book for Kathy Malchiotti and in um, about focusing oriented focusing oriented art therapy with children and adolescents with trauma I think it was just art therapy I don't think it was expressive arts I don't know one of the you know but it was in writing that chapter, which was published in 2014, that I was like, you know, I do something kind of different. It's like Judith Herman's, but it's focusing oriented. And so I created a new model that came out in her book. And so that's how I, I, I'm going to present the model. And then I have a case that goes with it to really show how, 
how you can um, use focusing oriented, like the different approaches, which approaches do you use at which stage? And, and I, I talk about that. And, and then the case sort of illustrates that. Beautiful. That yeah. sounds really, really um, like a rich uh, three hours. <laughs> yeah, I'm always amazed, actually. I just taught a three hour thing last night. And I was like, yeah, that, you know, I, I somehow have a way of presenting it in a way, I think because I do some talking, the PowerPoint experience, sharing, there'll be some breakout rooms, large group sharing questions, and then the cases. So I think because there's a lot of variety, like is it three hours, it's chock full, but it doesn't feel like, oh, I can't, I can't, I'm like too much. Overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I have a good sense of pacing. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm, I'm sure all of your years teaching in the various grad programs probably help with that, <laughs> that, that yeah. you, you're masterful in that area. So yeah well, well I guess when whoever comes will find out <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they will it sounds like it's going to be a, a really great workshop and um, I'm so grateful for you taking the time today to speak with me and to share about your work and um, I hope other people enjoy learning about it and might also be interested in seeking out your training, your books, and uh, the offerings that you provide at the Institute itself. Oh, thanks so much, Rena. Yes, because this, this workshop actually counts. We're starting a level one focusing oriented expressive arts training in September. And there's a prerequisite, which is an introductory level workshop. And this workshop will count as a prerequisite to enter the level one. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I mean, it's been a complete treat to be here with you and share with you. And, you know, I, I it's just been a, a very meaningful conversation. And, you know, it's always exciting that, you know, some things I've said before, but, you know, it's always fresh saying, it to, you know, but also like certain things came out in our conversation that were totally new that I don't think I ever shared in the way I did so that's it was a very it's a very special thing for me to to put my life together in this little time with you oh I'm glad that it was meaningful for you too yeah, yeah. um yeah it was it was a really great conversation and I learned a lot um about uh the work that you do about the history and the theory but also um about your life um, and so that's a real joy. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Creative Psychotherapist podcast. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation with Lori Rappaport. I, I was so inspired and just uh, found, I just was so excited, like listening to, um, the story of her life and kind of where her work has led her. Um, it was really fun. And I hope, I hope you maybe felt that too. Um, anyway, again, if you wanted to learn more from her, you could do so at the upcoming Expressive Therapy Summit virtually on March 23rd by heading over to www.expressivetherapiesummit.com, clicking on the virtual summit tab, and then finding her session in the menu there. Um, otherwise, if you wanted to learn more from her at her institute, the uh, Focusing and Expressive Art Institute, you can do that by heading over to www focusingarts.com. And of course, if you need to come back to it later, all those links will be in the show notes for you. If you enjoyed what you heard and you'd like to hear more, please don't forget to hit subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And we always would appreciate any ratings um, 
or feedback about the work that we're doing here on the show. All right, till next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Creative Psychotherapist. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For show notes, downloads, and additional resources, head over to the website at www.creativeclinicianscorner.com.